Hey Living Rock family, whether this is your first time watching one of our sermons or you've been a part of Living Rock for many, many years, we are so glad that you clicked on our video today. We would love to hear from you after the sermon is over. Um, if God spoke to you through the message and laid something on your heart, share it with us. Send us an email or call us on the phone. We would love to know what God is doing through Living Rock Church for you. We'd also love the chance to connect with you. So like us on Facebook, follow us on Instagram, and check out our website for all of the events and things that we have going on in the church. You can also get connected with all of our ministries or with Pastor Ryan. There's so much we have to offer, and we can't wait to share it with you. It's late in the 14th century, a man by the name of Nicholas Copernicus, a mathematician and an artist had been researching and making calculations about the solar system. And what he would propose would literally shock the world. He would, he would through his calculations, again, not an astronomer, but an artist, through his calculations, and then he would draw these things. He had worked for 16 years developing these manuscripts that would put forth the hypothesis that the earth is not the center of the universe, but that the sun was the center of our solar system, and that the earth is orbiting around the sun, and that every 24 hours will be a day, and 365 days will be a year to go around the sun, and that our earth was actually sitting on an axis, axis and it was tilted, and our seasons would be, he would explain this all through math. And then draw it. Surprising thing is that he died never revealing what he believed to be true. A man by the name of Ritkus, and also a fellow mathematician, he published the manuscripts a year after Nicholas Copernicus died. And those manuscripts were later actually banned by the church. They were not to be circulated. And we certainly know now in our century and in our decade that what Copernicus discovered is absolutely true. But the problem was that his work did not fit into the observational evidence his work didn't fit into what was the known narrative. And for those of you that might be here, part of the Flat Earth Society, I hate to inform you, but the earth is in fact round. But 900 years ago, that was not, that was not the reality. Because that's not what people observed. Religious scholars believed the earth was the center. Theology reflected that. So Copernicus died believing he was right, but being led by a culture to believe he was wrong. And the fear of that caused him to hold on to what he knew to be right and die without ever publishing. What is it like to believe with all your heart something to be true when the culture around you is caught up in something else? What's that like? We have a couple words in, in Christianity that we use to describe this feeling. One is unbelief. Unbelief is a sin. Why is it a sin? Because in the face of evidence, it refuses to believe what is there. Doubt, however, is not a sin. Doubt is simply being in two minds. It's having two realities that you're holding in full view of each other, and you're you're in between. You're, you're double-minded. In fact, all the Greek words in our Bible that talk about doubt have to do with being in two states of mind. The rea reality is saying this, but my, my, my faith is telling me this. 
And it's described as doubt. It's where you, you suspend, you're in suspension between faith and unbelief. So you can be holding on to two thoughts at the same time, and both can be true. In the world of Copernicus, the world looks this way. Observationally, it seems this way. But what he was proposing was absolutely true, even though it could not be confirmed observationally at that time. But it could be confirmed mathematically. In the book of Matthew, chapter 28, verse 17, because I know you didn't come to church today to hear about Copernicus. Matthew 28, verse 17, the scripture says that when they saw Jesus, he's risen from the dead, and when they saw him, it says they worshiped him, but some doubted. Now, one thing is for sure, all of them that were there worshiped. But in their worship, some doubted. Again, Doubt means two things are true. They're being held in the mind at the same time. In other words, I see Jesus. He's he's risen. He's in front of me right now, and I worship him. But at the same time, how come the world is still the same? How come the Romans are still in charge? How come my aunt is still sick? If he's risen, how, how, how come what I'm seeing and what I'm observing, not much has changed even though he's alive? And I believe that. I'm seeing him. Two things in my mind, not unrelated, but they're not contradictory each, either. Peter was walking on the water because he asked, Bid that I come, and Jesus said, come, and he's walking on the water. Peter gets out of the boat, walks on the water, but we know that the Bible tells us he started to sink. The reason was he started beholding another reality. The reality was that there was wind, and there were waves, and he was getting wet. And when they got back to the boat, Jesus said, you of little faith, why did you doubt? To believe is to be in one mind about accepting something as true. To disbelieve is to be in one mind about rejecting it. But to doubt is to waver somewhere in between the two realities. Both are true. There is wind. There are waves. There is water. You are getting wet. But Jesus' word is also true. And his word can suspend the realities of the natural world. In any given moment, and we see that throughout Scripture, we call those things miracles or supernatural events. For Copernicus, it was the accepted normal that kept him from publishing his work, which he knew to be right. Let's go to the book of Matthew 28, verse 8. It's resurrection morning. The women came to the tomb and says the women hurried away from the tomb, afraid yet filled with joy. They ran to tell his disciples and suddenly Jesus met them. Greetings, he said. They came to him, clasped his feet and worshiped him. And then Jesus said to them, do not be afraid. Go and tell my brothers to go to Galilee and there they will see me. But concerning the resurrection, there are two stories. There are two stories things that get published because it says in verse 11 while the women were on their way so while while they're going with the story of the resurrection while the women were on their way some of the guards went into the city and reported to the chief priest this is the next verse everything that had happened and when the chief priest had met with the elders and devised a plan They gave the soldiers a large sum of money. They told them, you are to say his disciples came during the night, stole him away while he were asleep. This report gets to the governor. We will satisfy him, keep you out of trouble. So the soldiers took the money, did as they were instructed. And this story, listen to this, this story is widely known Widely been circulated 
among the Jews even to this day. So when you consider that the Gospel of Matthew was written about 60 years after Jesus rose from the dead, this is a story that has been gaining momentum throughout the empire. Two stories, two narratives. It's becoming embedded in the culture. Sure, there are these people who believe Jesus is risen. And that just may be. The world in which we live in is not a closed system, but is an open system. That there is a God who intervenes in the affairs of humanity. But then there's this other narrative that says, no, the heavens are closed. This is all there is. What you see is what you get. When people die, there's no hope of resurrection. This is it. It's all there is. This is a story that is funded by the state. It's a story in which the state actually paid these men to continue to propagate. It gained momentum. In one story, the body is stolen. The other story, the body is raised from the dead. And we now, looking back over 2,000 years of history, we get mad at these priests. And we think, whoa, these liars. Liars they are. And yes, it is a lie. We know that to be true. But considering what people knew, considering the the climate and the atmosphere and the social order of the way things were 2,000 years ago, they have only propagated what most people would accept as the truth. Because it seems absurd to believe that a man rose from the dead. They're just caving in to what's the most probable, plausible explanation of what happened within the culture that they knew. Given the assumptions that the guards and the priests and the rulers of state have concerning the world They simply put forth a narrative that is not just possible, but in their minds, probable. That's the system of Pharaoh. It's the the system of Rome. It's the system of Babylon. It wants you to believe that they have all power to tell you what's true and to tell you what's false. And this narrative is still circulating the world to this day. But I believe there is a new narrative that is taking hold. It's also gaining momentum, and it is the fact that, no, this world is not closed. The universe is not a closed system, but it's open. Christ is raised from the dead. And because he's risen... Nothing in this world is as we think it is. It changes everything. Whole new set of rules apply, and we don't even know them all. We just scratch the surface in the new rules of the kingdom of God. Don't be a Copernicus. Afraid of what you've discovered. Afraid of what you believe now to be absolutely true. In spite of the fact that the world around us has not caught up to reality. All your life you've been taught by your surroundings. All your life it says that for a man to rise from the dead is impossible. But that's what happened. Jesus is risen. And just just how important is this? Why, it's everything. When Paul writes to the Corinthian church, listen to what he says in 15th chapter. And I'm reading from the message. Let me ask you of something profound yet troubling. If you became believers because you trusted the proclamation that Christ is alive, risen from the dead, how can you let people say that there is no such thing as the resurrection? 
That there's no living Christ? Paul begins now to iterate some real consequences if there's no living Christ. Face it, he says, if there's no resurrection for Christ, everything we've told you is smoke and mirrors. Not only that, but we would be guilty of telling a string of bald-faced lies about God, bare-faced lies about God. All these affidavits we passed on to you verifying that God raised up Christ, these will be sheer fabrications if there's no resurrection. If corpses can't be raised, then Christ wasn't. Because he was indeed dead, and if Christ weren't raised, then all you're doing is wandering about in the dark, lost as ever. It's even worse for those who died hoping in Christ and resurrection because they're already in their graves. If all we get out of Christ is a little inspiration for a few short years, then we're a pretty sorry lot. That's what Paul says. See, the narrative that we've been born into says that we need to rely on our senses, that there are things that just can't happen. They're impossible in a closed system. And that's the majority view, but it is the wrong view. The minority view is resurrection, that God has, when we were born again, given us organs. He's given us faculties to be able to discern the new world, the new creation that he has given and that he has set up. You know, just like in the, God has given you, you uh, uh, the faculties of hearing so you can hear a thunderstorm approaching or hear a car out on the street. He gave you eyes to see a sunset. You don't hear a sunset. You don't use your ears to see the sunrise and set. You use your eyes. And it's got to be the same when we come to the house of the Lord, to the gathering of God's people. We don't necessarily use our eyes and our ears. We need to use the organs that God has given to us since we were born again. That is faith, hope, and love. We have these things now that we're to use to discern the very presence and activity of God and his spirit in our midst. As a community... Today, we're gathered here to worship Jesus. And some of you are experiencing him right now. In fact, all you can see this morning is Jesus. It's all you see is Jesus. Everywhere you look in the church today, when you look at people, all you see is the Lord and his work. You feel his spirit moving. But there are some of you here today some of you who are maybe watching this broadcast this morning or later, and you've gotten so used to not exercising the faculties that God has given to you that going to church, worshiping with God's people is no longer a supernatural event for you. It's just something that's observable with your natural senses and feelings and eyes and ears. And you judge and determine whether you're going to go or keep attending where you are simply on the basis of what you feel by your natural, discernible senses that you've gotten so accustomed to using because that's what the world wants you to use. Don't die knowing the truth and being afraid to publish the truth. We don't want to become just observers. We want to be worshipers. And to be a worshiper does not mean, as we saw earlier, that I might not have some doubts. I worship, and yet at the same time, I can be wrestling with realities in my life. As a follower of Christ, I'm not just a fair-weather believer. You know, the thing is, a, a pilot can get up into, um, 
can get in the air and, and, and travel a great distance and not be worried about what weather systems. I mean, they'll always get a weather report, but because of, of instruments and navigational abilities and the abilities that they have to read barometric pressure and the ability to be able to see weather systems long before they approach, plans can be made so that you can, for the most part, travel safely in just about any kind of weather. And that should be true for us as believers because we have instruments too. We have the instruments of God's word and his promises. And they never fail us. I have presided probably now over, over more than 100 funerals or memorial services and graveside services in my time as a pastor. And... Um, It's been my privilege to talk to people and my honor, and I believe it to be an honor, a sacred honor, to walk with people through the most difficult time in their life, the loss of a loved one. And what I've come to understand in being with people time and time again is that people experiencing, experience different levels of hurt and different levels of pain. It is not all the same for everybody. The three things that I've seen that affect the depth that someone feels pain and hurt, and one being the shock of it. It's often brought on by the suddenness of the event, how it occurs, how you find out how it's made known to you that your loved one has passed, the very shock of it is, creates, causes pain. The second thing is the hole that that person now leaves in your life. The hole. And that's generally based upon how close you were to them, the relationship that you had throughout your life with that person. But a third thing also happens and develops that I've noticed as I've worked with people and walked with them through the valley of the shadow of death as Christ walks with all of us, and that is your natural tendency when something happens like a death is to question everything. It can throw you into a place where you begin to question, where your faith gets held up to be examined. You have to face that. Doesn't matter how much you say you believe in the resurrection, when tragedy comes, you're tempted to believe the other narrative and the reason why. It's because that's the way the world talks about death. So sad for your loss. They were such a good person. They talk about your loved one like it's done and gone and there's, there's no future, there's no hope, there's no we'll see him or her again, there's no... The world doesn't talk that way. And so it reinforces this narrative that, well, you know, the body's been stolen. It's tragic, but there's nothing supernatural here. Don't even look there. We just sung a song today called, He Turns Graves into Gardens. Who says that? People that have the organ of faith to see that there's more than a tomb Most of the memories that we have attached to the person who has lost is attached to the natural world, what they looked like, what they did, where they went, how they felt, what we did with them, what they did with us. Every conversation is to that end. But for those who believe, there's a hopefulness in our grieving because we've experienced and understand the reality that God has also met our needs in other dynamic ways. We've begun to become accustomed to God touching us in this world. Peace that there's no understanding for. Love that is so undeserved. You hear what I'm saying, church? Forgiveness and the, and the removal of shame that seemed like it was impossible. And yet it was the reality because Christ is risen. 
That's what Paul's trying to get to the Corinthians. If Christ isn't raised and you're still in the dark, you're walking around in the dark, your sins aren't forgiven, the grave is it. We're miserable. We're a sorry lot, he says. And we're just giving you smoke and mirrors every Sunday in the pulpit. To lose your trust in God is, your, is the ultimate loss. But the very nature of having faith in God helps us see that there is a constructive side to doubt. I've known people who have wrestled doubt through loss, through suffering, through pain. And they come away with a stronger faith when they wrestle doubt. Not just dismiss it, but wrestle it through. Acknowledging the other reality, but holding on to the one that is greater. As I mature in Christ, I'm, I'm more informed, I pray, by the, my faith than by the systems of the world that I've been born into. By the narratives and the lies that just keep being peddled from one generation to the next supported by the state, funded by individuals. No, say this, and they'll believe it. They'll believe it because it's the most probable thing. Think about it. Matthew is writing to Christians over 60 years after all these events happened, and he's saying, there's two stories. They're still in circulation. Which one are you going to hold on to? Because there is a resurrection, heaven and earth are now not two separate places. They're together. They're connected. Which is why Jesus taught us to pray, thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. That for a long time, the church I grew up in, we were just heard preaching so that we could go to heaven. I realize now that wasn't all correct, completely correct. The preaching I hear helps heaven come to me. <laughs> God wants to put heaven in here. Not just keep me in suspension until the day when I go there. The anxiety and the fear that we see in the world today is more than just a feeling. It is a heading. It's a direction. It's a trajectory. And so the peace and the love and the life that you carry in Christ is also a direction, a trajectory. In conclusion this morning, Paul writes to the Colossians in chapter 3, and he says, if you're serious, if you're serious about living this new resurrection life with Christ, if you're serious about it, then act like it. Pursue the things over which Christ presides. Don't shuffle along, eyes to the ground, absorb with the things right in front of you. Look up. Be alert to what's going on around Christ. That's where the action is. See things from his perspective. Your old life is dead. Your new life, which is your real life, even though invisible to spectators, look at that, even though invisible to the spectators, is with Christ and God. He is your life. When Christ, your real life, remember, shows up again on this earth, You'll show up too, the real you, the glorious you. Meanwhile, be content with obscurity like Christ. And that means killing off everything connected with that way of death. Sexual promiscuity, impurity, lust, doing whatever you feel like whenever you feel like it and grabbing whatever attracts your fancy. That's a life shaped by things and feelings instead of by God. 
it's because of this kind of thing that God's about to explode in anger. In other words, which narrative, which story is controlling the way you think and the way you act? Only you can answer that. Which story is controlling what you do, what you do with your time, what you do with your money, what you do with your talent? Which story? If this is all there is, and you believe the other story, may God have mercy on your soul. (laughs) But if you believe the story of the resurrection, then you have all the hope in this world. And nobody can take that from you. And no lie peddled or funded by any system of this world can rob you of the joy and the peace that knowing him and knowing that he is risen brings to your life. to families that are here that have lost precious loved ones. You will see them again. And the body that you see them in will be glorious, raised in the likeness of Christ's body from the dead. That's the truth. And that's the hope that we bring to this world. It's not closed. God can do a miracle in you and in you. It's not closed and in you. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word today. We are journeying to freedom, a freedom that comes because you have given us the organ of faith, hope, and love. In spite of what we see in this world, in spite of what we hear, in spite of the daily narratives that reinforce the lie that was told 2,000 years ago, funded and supported by a religious system and a system of the state, we have hope. We believe in the risen Lord. And because he is risen, we are risen. And when you tell us, take a Sabbath day of rest, then we can do so because you rest. We can believe that you will and are taking care of us and providing for us. As surely as you told Israel, that they did not need to hoard the daily manna, but they'd pray for daily bread. So also, Father, today, we pray and thank you for daily bread, that we have all that we need today, that's sufficient for today is the grace that you have given to us. We bless your name, Father, and thank you Amen.